is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. There are four main types of Americans fighting on the ground in Syria. Special Forces soldiers, CIA agents, Islamic extremists and anarchists. That's the opening line to a new investigation published by Mother Jones about America's role in the war in Syria that's killed at least half a million people and displaced 12 million Syrians. My name is Shane Bauer. I'm a senior reporter at Mother Jones. Last year, I traveled to Syria to understand America's role in one of the 21st century's bloodiest conflicts. America did not start the war, but it has become such a fog that few Americans know how deeply we are involved. It's a remarkable shift in foreign policy. And how does the U.S. avoid getting pulled into a bloody seven-year civil war? A battlefield with shifting allegiances and horrific civilian casualties. The only thing that seemed worse than getting sucked into the conflict was not getting involved at all. Shane Bauer's new two-part 30,000-word investigation on Syria is headlined Behind the Lines. Shane's been reporting on the Middle East for over a decade. He's one of three Americans detained in 2009 while hiking in Iraq's Kurdish region near the Iranian border. He and Josh Fatal were held for 26 months, and Sarah Shord was held for 13 months, much of it in solitary confinement. Shane Bauer has gone on to become a prize-winning reporter. In 2017, he won a National Magazine Award for his piece, My Four Months as a Private Prison Guard. He later turned the piece into the book American Prison, a reporter's undercover journey into the business of punishment. Shane, thanks so much for joining us again. This is an astounding expose, well over 100 pages. Uh, talk about why you went to Syria. Well, um, I personally uh, used to live in Syria. Uh, I studied Arabic there years ago. I lived there and was working as a reporter in the Middle East. And, um, you know, I had been following what had happened in Syria after the Arab Spring and as the kind of civil war uh, unfolded. And like many people, just really got uh, kind of overwhelmed, both by the complexity and just how what a tragedy it was, and uh, found myself kind of ebbing in and out of, of the, uh, paying attention to the conflict. And uh, I started to wonder, you know, I knew that, that the United States was involved. We've had many moments of, of involvement that have gotten grabbed headlines and others that have gotten less tension. And I really wanted to kind of untangle uh, our role in that war, uh, which, you know, is one of this century's greatest tragedies. Um, and I wanted to understand not just um, the role of, uh, you know, um, Obama and diplomats, but of the, the special forces, of the, the CIA, and of private citizens who joined and fought on different sides of the conflict. Well, let's go back, I mean, to the, the position uh, uh, of the U.S. Uh, in this war and how it impacted directly on your reporting. Explain why you were initially denied uh, a visa to Syria and how you managed to get in. Uh, I applied for a, a visa, um, you know, to Damascus and uh, was denied uh, shortly after a, a chemical attack, uh, a chlorine attack on uh, the d suburb of uh, Ghouta. Uh, after that attack, um, the Trump administration uh, launched missiles on some research centers uh, outside of Damascus, and my visa was, was later denied. Um, uh, so the way that I went in was uh, through Iraq. I entered uh, northeast Syria, an area controlled by the Syrian Democratic Forces, which are the um, kind of uh, allies on the ground of the U.S.-backed coalition. They control about 25 percent of, of the country, um, most of the Kurdish areas, and also um, uh, Arab cities uh, like Raqqa and uh, mixed cities like Membij. So I crossed in uh, with permission of, of the SDF. And how long did you stay? Uh, I spent three weeks in the country. Well, let's go back to, to 2011. I mean, many have raised uh, uh, questions about why uh, the Syrians didn't immediately join in uh, as people across uh, the Arab world and North Africa were, were protesting against authoritarian regimes. You point out, of course, that the memory of the attempt at an uprising against Bashar al-Assad's father, Hafiz al-Assad, and that regime's response to the protesters was a massive inhibitor. So 
explain what happened in 1982. Yeah, I mean, I think this, uh, you know, gave Syrians pause. There was, uh, in 1982, there was an uprising by the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, and it was brutally crushed. And in some in some ways, you know, looking back, uh, there's, there's no comparison to what's happened, you know, in recent years, but uh, it was almost a precursor. You know, the um, uh, Hafez al-Assad, the current president's father, uh, leveled parts of the city and, you know, uh, much like uh, Bashar has done, you know, in recent years. So talk about oil and gas and what this has to do with this conflict. Uh, Syria, you know, compared to neighboring countries like Iraq, um, you know, their their oil reserves are relatively small, but control of of the oil in the country has uh, has been an important factor in um, for groups to to gain power and have uh, resources and money to, to fight the war. Uh, a lot of the oil in Syria is in uh, the northeast, um, and it. Early in the conflict, came under the control of uh, Nusra, which is a branch of Al Qaeda. Uh, later, was controlled by ISIS. At one point, ISIS, uh, between Iraq and Syria, controlled about 25 uh, oil wells. Uh, at at one point, they were making uh, around uh, 50 million dollars a month uh, in oil. So this, you know, was a huge reason that they were able to expand. And who like were they, they were selling to? They were selling to. Uh, they were selling locally within their territory. They were uh, smuggling oil out uh, to Turkey, Iraq, and to uh, Syrian regime-held uh, areas. And as you say, actually, that made uh, ISIS the best financed terrorist organization ever. But now you say the SDF, the Syrian Democratic Forces, who, you know, their U.S. Yeah. allies, they control most of the oil and yeah, gas reserves right. in Syria. Explain how that came about. There was a moment uh, in 2017 when uh, the, the U.S.-led coalition and the SDF were uh, fighting ISIS uh, in Raqqa. The Syrian government and Russians were, were fighting ISIS in Deir ez-Zor. And the U United States and, and Russia had, uh, before this, essentially made an agreement to kind of divvy up territory in Syria. Uh, the United States-led coalition would control uh, everything east of the Euphrates, and Russia would have the remaining uh, territory. And the, the oil is mostly on the east, uh, east side of the Euphrates River. And uh, the Russians and Syrians, uh, at one point, started to cross the river uh, in an attempt to, to take the oil. And uh, the U.S.'s allies, uh, backed by American jets, uh, literally raced through the desert. There was a period where, you know, the uh, forces that were involved in this uh, explained to me as a race between uh, between the SDF and the regime and their, you know, superpower backers. Uh, so the SDF in the United States essentially s swooped in and, and got these uh, oil wells. But uh, it didn't end there. There were conflicts later. Some might remember uh, headlines about uh, Russian mercenaries that had been uh, killed by American jets in Syria in February 2018. Uh, when this happened, uh, Secretary of Defense Mattis uh, said, you know, he, he couldn't understand why this happened. They were uh, the, some militias and these Russian mercenaries were attacking. Uh, a training uh, area for their for the, the U.S.'s local allies. What he didn't mention was that the area they were attacked was a uh, the Syria's largest gas plant, uh, which was under the control of the United States. It was uh, a gas plant that was started by Conoco, the American company, and um, the the United States retaliated and then subsequently turned Conoco into a, a base, into a, a coalition base. So I want to go back um, to the uprising that took place and the hesitancy of Syrians to join in the Arab Spring that yeah. was breaking out in so many places. But then what you felt were the causes of the uprising in Syria. You know, I think in some ways Syria was like, uh, you know, the other countries in the region. Uh, this was a time when people were rising up against uh, dictators. They were you know, rising up against authoritarianism. Uh, and, you know, Syrians had been living under the rule of uh, Bashar al-Assad and, and his father, uh, Hafez, since 1970. Um, the, the Syrian government uh, was uh, notoriously heavy-handed, um, large amounts of political prisoners, uh, all dissent was, was quelled. 
um, you know, children in school grew up, uh, you know, giving chance to the, to the president. And, uh, you know, there were no elections uh, other than kind of referendums on, uh, you know, whether or not the current president sh should stay in power. Uh, so they were, you know, protesting against this and uh, initially calling for uh, government reforms and end to um, uh, emergency, a state of emergency that had been in place for many years. And once the uh, security forces uh, started to fire on protesters with live ammunition, uh, the demands quickly changed to demanding the fall of the regime, like had what had happened in, in other countries like Egypt uh, or Yemen. But the thing is, unlike other uh, uh, uprisings in, in the Arab world and, and North Africa, as you, and you return to this point again and again in the piece, no other uprising, no other revolt uh, against a government had as many outside forces intervening. I mean, from uh, Russia to the U.S., Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Bahrain, ISIS. Uh, so let's begin um, with ISIS. First yeah. of all, how did ISIS form? ISIS formed in Syria um, from al-Qaeda Iraq when they came in. Uh, and the fact that it grew, as you point out, also has to do with the fact that as Assad was arresting nonviolent protesters, yeah. he was simultaneously releasing Islamists from Assyrian jails. Right. So you, there was a period of, um, you know, uh, a year, less than a year, that there were these protesters. There were it was the government uh, cracking down on them, and uh, these activists were getting arrested. They were getting tortured. They were disappearing. They were getting killed. Uh, and while this was happening, Islamists were getting released from prisons. These are people that had been in Assad's prisons for a long time. Uh, at the same time, you had in neighboring Iraq a long, you know, uh, uh, an insurgency that existed since the American intervention, uh, an insurgency that uh, turned into uh, what was called al-Qaeda in Iraq that uh, had, you know, become very powerful and then was, was beaten back by uh, U.S. forces and their uh, tribal allies. So there was still a, a kind of core of that insurgency that existed in Iraq. And they essentially uh, dispatched uh, people to Syria to start something there. And that became what was called uh, uh, Nusra. It was a, a branch of al-Qaeda in Iraq. Uh, Nusra joined up with a lot of these um, people that had been released from Assad's prisons. And uh, in 2013, ISIS essentially, Nusra split in two, and ISIS uh, became a kind of even more extreme version of al Qaeda. And uh, eventually, the, the two groups were, were at war with each other. ISIS was, of course, at war with everyone. And where did Russia and the U.S. fit into this picture? The United States. Uh, you know, Obama was making uh, statements early on in the conflict, 2011, he was calling for Assad to step down, but it wasn't really backed by anything. Um, officials in the White House told me that uh, they essentially believed that he was going to step down uh, like Mubarak had, and Obama kind of wanted to uh, get a, you know, ahead of, be on the right side of history. Uh, but that, of course, didn't happen, and uh, eventually um, the United States, you know, got uh, one of their, their first major moments was when uh, the Assad regime used uh, sarin gas uh, in Ghouta in 2013, in the summer. Uh, Obama, before, before this, uh, this gas attack, had uh, said that he had a red line, where if the Syrian regime used chemical weapons, uh, he would, you know, strike. So the chemical weapons were used, and there was a, a long kind of um, back and forth, and Obama decided uh, not to strike. Um, but shortly after that, uh, just months after that, uh, a new CIA program was started. Uh, it was called Operation Timber Sycamore. It was a billion-dollar program. Uh, Why it was, Timber Sycamore? Um, I don't know, actually. <laughs> I don't know how they named it. Um, but it was, it was uh, one of the largest CIA uh, covert operations since the United States backed the Mujahideen in Afghanistan. Um, and this program was uh, meant to arm uh, the anti-Assad rebels. Uh, but there was a kind of strange uh, strategy around it. Um, officials uh, in, that were in the administration at the time described the strategy as uh, not being to uh, cause— 
to help the rebels to win, but they were attempting to create a stalemate where, uh, you know, there would be enough pressure on Assad to bring him to the negotiating table, um, and then he would essentially negotiate himself out of power. Uh, this, uh, of course, didn't work. Um, it, I think many now see it as a foolish strategy, the idea that Assad would, uh, would negotiate himself out of power, uh, in retrospect, seems absurd. Um, but that's what the strategy was. And the, the U.S. was also, you know, kind of, they were worried about the, the strange thing about when they decided to start arming these rebels was that they were also worried about the kind of, um, uh, the Islamicization of the opposition at this point, you know, by 2014, uh, ISIS was in the picture, uh, Nusra was a major player uh, in the opposition, and they were afraid of them essentially taking power. Um, of course, the, you know, the, the, the weapons that the CIA was sending in, including anti-tank missiles, uh, were ending up in the hands uh, of Nusra to some extent, uh, because the groups that it was backing were sharing territory uh, with with Nusra, even even though they weren't necessarily they weren't on the same page. Um, these the groups that, that the CIA were backing uh, were generally more secular um, and didn't have the same vision as Al Qaeda, but they were fighting the same enemy, and uh, they would sometimes sell weapons to each other, and sometimes the CIA backed groups would give weapons uh, to Nusra. You mean U.S. weapons? Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, and in 2015, Russia um, intervened on behalf of the uh, Assad regime, and uh, Russia said it was intervening to, to fight terrorism, uh, to fight ISIS, uh, but its uh, initial strikes were, were actually against these uh, um, CIA-backed uh, opposition forces. So, you know, there was kind of—this was, in some ways, the beginning of a kind of proxy war uh, between the U.S. and Russia um, over— who was going to control Syria. You know, Russia, Syria had been um, kind of a Russian uh, client state for, for decades. It had been, you know, really outside of U.S. influence. The United States seemed to have seen an opportunity to, uh, to bring it into its sphere. But once Russia intervened, that uh, option really went, went off the table. And you also mentioned, Shane, um, as far as what the focus of U.S. policy was, I mean, a couple of the people that you spoke to, and, and perhaps there were more than, than uh, the people that you quote, that there was a lot of disappointment when, in fact, the shift uh, occurred from focusing on Assad, whether a regime change was intended or not, or planned or not, to the exclusive focus being on fighting ISIS as yeah. uh, the U.S. objective. Now, there were many also who were skeptical of uh, U.S. intentions in Syria because of the history of uh, attempted interventions yeah. by the U.S. and actually the 1945 coup. Right. Uh, so, could you say a little bit about that, what you heard from Syrians yeah. about, about the U.S. position? Well, you know, everybody, the Americans and the Syrians are are confused and have been confused about what the U.S. position is. And I think that's because uh, there has not been one single position. Uh, there have been uh, at least two camps within uh, the American government uh, uh, to different goals uh, for what to do in Syria. And these camps have been at odds at times. You know, I described the, the CIA project, was, which kind of represented uh, one camp that was kind of represented by the CIA and, and the State Department under the Obama administration that wanted to, uh, you know, uh, get rid of Assad. There was another camp that was uh, essentially coming from—it was still fighting the Iraq war in many ways, and that camp was strictly focused on ISIS. ISIS, you know, was an outgrowth of the, uh, the U.S. war in Iraq. Um, and so there was this group that was kind of um, uh, represented by the Pentagon that uh, was essentially still fighting the war in Iraq that spilled into Syria. That group uh, did not want to see Assad go because they worried that it would just give more of an opportunity for ISIS. Um, so, you know, these, these, there were a couple of years where these two missions overlapped. Uh, there was the CIA still trying to get rid of Assad and then um, the Pentagon uh, fighting ISIS. And, uh, you know, the, the Pentagon um, uh, camp ultimately won uh, because of, of Russian intervention, and that kind of took off the table the, uh, the notion of, of overthrowing Assad. I want to ask you about the area of northeast Syria called Rojava, yep. um, where 
the Kurds are fighting. And first talk about the U.S. relationship with these Kurdish soldiers, mm -hmm. and then talk about this whole area. Sure. Uh, the uh, Rojava is uh, run by a party um, called the PYD, and its kind of military branch is the, the YPG. And the YPG are uh, now the, uh, the United States' uh, main allies in Syria. They're uh, specifically in the, the mission to fight ISIS. The People's Protection Unit. Right, right. Um, the, the People's Protection Units are uh, very closely tied to the, the PKK uh, in Turkey. Um, which, you know, complicates the, the U.S. role um, in, in another way in Syria, because uh, the United States considers the PKK to be a terrorist organization. Uh, Turkey, you know, it's Turkey's mortal enemy. Uh, Turkey also considers the YPG uh, to be uh, its enemy, and it sees the YPG and the PKK as one and the same. Um, what is happening in Rojava is, is uh, very interesting and very, really unique in Syria. Um, Rojava, I think, is, uh, I think, without a doubt, the most uh, um, kind of uh, calm uh, and stable part of Syria uh, for the time being. Um, it has it's uh, essentially um, autonomously administered. Uh, it has implemented a, a system uh, of kind to try to try to create a system of direct democracy. So uh, cities are broken down into uh, communes or neighborhood communes. Uh, communes elect uh, co-chairs, a man and a woman. Uh, they have various committees for economics and solving neighborhood disputes and uh, really try to kind of localize uh, governance. Um, and then Rojava in general is broken into uh, s uh, several uh, cantons that are uh, largely self-administered. So, you know, in a region, in a country that has been ruled by uh, strongmen, there has been um, this kind of experiment where, uh, in trying to create a more horizontal type of governance, uh, where there isn't uh, a strongman in power. Uh, although there is a figure of Abdullah Ocalan, who's the founder of the PKK, who is, uh, you know, a major uh, figure in the in Rojava, uh, he had kind of founded the ideology uh, that, you know, the whole area is, is sort of governed by. And this follows up on a theme that you follow throughout your um, pieces, and that is looking at Americans who have gone there. Yeah. Um, it is seen, you say, as a kind of anarchist utopia. Talk about the Americans you met in Rojava. Yeah. Uh, I met one American there uh, who was a volunteer with the YPG, so he was uh, fighting with the YPG against ISIS. Uh, there, since roughly 2000. Where did he come from? Uh, I don't know what state he came from. He didn't tell me. I just know he's from the United States. Um, but there have been uh, Americans uh, traveling there since roughly 2015 uh, to join uh, the the YPG. Uh, initially, these Americans were a real kind of mix. There were, uh, you know, Christian fundamentalists that wanted to go and fight Arabs. There were uh, former uh, Marines uh, who wanted to get back into battle. And then there was uh, a kind of cohort of, of leftists, uh, largely anarchists. And those are the ones that, that are still going. There are less of these uh, other types. The YPG have kind of, what I've been told, they've kind of cracked down on uh, the kind of more right-wing elements. Um, so uh, these people will go, um, and they'll go through training with the YPG, and then they will uh, you know, join a battalion and, uh, and fight against ISIS. And how did they respond to you being there? Uh, I met with uh, some of the international fighters, um, you know, sat down with them and did an interview. Uh, they were uh, a bit cautious with me, I would say, um, but were, you know, open to, to talking to me. Well, you mentioned, I mean, of course, very few people know. I mean, I was stunned when I read that, that they're American, and, and you mm -hmm. also spoke to a Frenchman and an Irishman, mm -hmm. that they're anarchists who are uh, involved in this. But also, you talk about a group, uh, a Russian group called the Wagner Group, yeah. or Wa Wagner Group, uh, that you describe as a, quote, shadowy Russian Blackwater-like private army. Yeah. So could you talk about what they're up to in Syria? And are those the same mercenaries that the U.S. allegedly killed? 
Yeah, that is exactly uh, who who the U.S. Uh, jets killed. Um, uh, you know, there's a, still a lot of mystery around what they're doing in Syria. That uh, that battle over the Conoco gas field was the first time uh, that I know of that they showed up in uh, at least in English language news. Um, there uh, had been reports that they uh, had contracts with the uh, Syrian government. Uh, saying that they would have a cut in profits if they, you know, reclaimed uh, oil wells from ISIS. Um, you know, but they're mercenaries, and they've—Syria uh, is not the only place that they've worked in. But, uh, you know, part of this is Russia—Russian law doesn't actually allow for mercenaries. So there's a lot of controversy, uh, from what I've heard back in Russia, about— um, Does American law allow for mercenaries? <laughs> I don't know. Accompanying the piece, you have videos. And I want to turn to one of the ones that Mother Jones published in the Behind the Lines investigation. This video is entitled Burying Syria's Dead. Uh, it features uh, you following a forensics team as they uncover the bodies of those who were killed during the U.S. led military assault on Raqqa in 2017. I'm uh, standing in a, a small park in Raqqa with a crew of first responders. Their job is to recover bodies throughout the, the city. These are ambulance drivers, essentially. For a while, their job was to try to rescue people after a bombing. Afterwards, after ISIS left, they continued to work as, as first responders, although the term first responders maybe not uh, so accurate now because they're still essentially responding to the same attacks that had happened months ago. This is a child and his body is completely burned. You know, they've been doing this for months. This is their job. Did you find anything? Yes, there's a smell, a strong smell. This is, uh, I think, 16 guys, and they really can't get a lot of the bodies out of the building. Why don't you remove the body? We need heavy equipment. So they have a huge backlog of, of work. When I'm there, they're still finding mass graves. By May 2018, the team had found 750 bodies half were civilians. They estimated that 4,000 to 5,000 remained. In Syria, the American war really uh, ramped up pretty dramatically once Trump became president. Overnight, airstrikes lighting up the Syrian sky. 59 Tomahawk cruise missiles have hit a Syrian air base. Trump really loosened the rules of engagement. The military approach in Syria switched to uh, what he called annihilation tactics. In 2017, there was, in the summer, started to be preparations for a, uh, a much larger battle. We know more this morning about a wave of coalition airstrikes against ISIS and the battle to take back a key city in Syria under its control, Raqqa. Don't underestimate how important this is. We're talking the capital of ISIS. The battle of Raqqa was four months long, roughly 4,000 airstrikes, and 95% of those were, were from American jets. I think if, if something like uh, Raqqa had happened in the Vietnam War, for example, it might have been one of the, the most sensational parts of that war. It was, uh, you know, just a total onslaught. And, the, you know, the coalition claims that they were very precise in their uh, campaign on Raqqa, but civilians that I spoke to described a campaign that was uh, blanketing the city with, with bombs. You know, it was strange to be in a situation where uh, people are digging up a body in a park and it's completely normal. There's kids walking around, young guys playing, playing soccer. You know, people move on and try to kind of bring back a, some kind of semblance of, of normalcy. to a particular location on the outskirts of the city where there is a, a very large mass grave. Then 
then they go through a kind of brief prayer. Allahu Akbar. It was touching that these guys who uh, are just day in and day out digging up bodies, Allahu Akbar. you know, still feel compelled to kind of give them that final send off. head home for the day and start it all again the next day. That's a clip from the investigation Shane Bauer did. It's called Burying the Dead. Talk about who these dead bodies are and what exactly happened there in Raqqa that led to these deaths. Uh, so starting in the summer of 2017, uh, the U.S.-led coalition and the Syrian Democratic Force on the ground uh, launched a, a major assault on Raqqa. Raqqa was uh, the capital of uh, the ISIS uh, caliphate, uh, and it was a, a massive battle. I visited Raqqa. I mean, I've never seen anything like this. I've been to Fallujah, and there's no comparison. I mean, uh, the city is just utterly destroyed. Uh, the downtown was clearly uh, blanketed with bombs. Um, the coalition jets, 95 percent of which were, were American, uh, uh, launched uh, around 4,000 uh, munitions from airplanes. Um, a Marines battalion said that it uh, literally melted the barrels of its howitzers from launching uh, from the volume that it was shooting. Um, and ISIS was, uh, you know, using every tactic they could, suicide bombers, uh, they were mining everything, uh, and uh, were using uh, human shields, filling buildings with civilians. So this, this war had a, a really serious toll. Um, and when I was there in May, uh, this was uh, roughly six months after the, the battle had ended, they were still recovering bodies. Uh, there was a team of around 16 men that uh, were going through and trying to get bodies out of the, the rubble still. Um, they had very little resources. Uh, they mostly relied on shovels and picks. And um, the, they, uh, one of the doctors told me that the bodies that the, so there were there were two kind of uh, types or places that they would find these. There were uh, in the buildings, and then there were mass graves. There were mass graves all throughout the city that were uh, hastily dug either right before uh, the attack or during. And the mass graves tended to have uh, ISIS fighters in them. So imagine they're fighting and they just, you know, somebody is killed and they throw them in the, the mass grave. Uh, the buildings, however, the doctors told me were mostly civilians, uh, you know, which suggests that there were many buildings uh, that were bombed that didn't have fighters in them, you know, and, and this is something that people have repeated to me in the streets of Raqqa all the time, you know, that. Uh, we didn't have, there was no ISIS in the street when, when we were bombed and, you know, all these buildings got killed and some of them, their neighbors were still trapped, their bodies were still trapped in the buildings. Um, you know, it's, it smelled, I mean, if you, depending on where you were in the city, it was just really uh, horrific. And they, they also, these, these first responders, I should say, many of them were first responders during ISIS's reign. So they were also racing to buildings after they were bombed. And uh, one of them told me that uh, the, one of the first things that the jets targeted were the ambulances themselves. And he showed me a, a pile of, of bombed out ambulances. And they would, uh, you know, try to hide their, their ambulances under trees, you know, park them under trees or, or uh, something to uh, disguise them from the jets so they didn't get destroyed. Well, I'd like to go back to, you know, what conditions uh, were like under ISIS in Raqqa. One yep. of the people that you spoke to while you were there uh, as part of this investigation uh, behind the lines in Syria uh, was uh, uh, Zayn, someone mm -hmm. you called Zayn. His yep. identity wasn't revealed right. and his uh, face was blurred. Uh, he was imprisoned by ISIS in Raqqa. And in this clip, he takes you around the sports stadium that was converted into a prison under yeah. ISIS rule. He details the torture he experienced while he was detained there, and he was not identified uh, uh, for fear of his own uh, security. So this is uh, Zayn. The main prison where we were held has 15 solitary cells at the end of the hallway. So it was the first time he had been back since he himself was in prison there. And here were the group cells. 
We were in the solitary cells. Every once in a while, they would take me out to interrogate and torture me. They had us blindfolded. We didn't know who beat us or who interrogated us. But most of the time, we were interrogated by children. They sounded like children, not adults. These are the handcuffs they used. They used to cut our arms. They showed us no mercy. He had scars on his wrist, and they would cuff him behind his back and then hang him, and then they would interrogate him. This way, even if you haven't done anything, you will still confess. Zayn also recalled coming to that stadium before ISIS turned it into a prison. Do you remember coming here when it was just a stadium? After having shown me you know, the prison, he talks about how he used to come there as a kid. And the stadium was the best of its kind. Right here were training rooms. They would hold weddings uh, in the area that was now a prison. All these were celebration halls used for weddings and events. They all took place here. Every once in a while, the stadium would be filled with people. Two teams would come play. Those were the best days. But since ISIS came, it's become the worst days for those who entered the stadium. So that's Zayn, whom you spoke to. Can you explain why, first of all, he didn't want his identity revealed now that ISIS is gone from Raqqa? And how did people like Zayn respond to this massive bombardment uh, that uh, the U.S. led and that led to, as many say, the definitive defeat of ISIS, at least in Raqqa? Uh, so Zayn told me that he didn't want his identity revealed uh, because he essentially didn't know what the future held. I mean, ISIS is the latest version, was the latest version uh, or uh, incarnation of a group that has existed for, you know, some 15 years. There have been various versions uh, of uh, this kind of um, very brutal uh, Islamic extremist group that uh, cropped up, you know, in the early uh, years of the Iraq war. Uh, and, you know, he thought this, this may not be the end of this organization, uh, and he didn't want to be seen uh, saying anything that could be interpreted as critical of them. People like Zen, who, you know, he, he details in this video um, the kind of torture mm. yeah, that yeah. he uh, uh, was subjected to, what was the response of right. people like him uh, uh, to the U.S. bombardment? Yeah. Uh, you know, I spent a week in Raqqa, and people responded in different ways. Uh, but I would say the most common response was, we are happy to be rid of ISIS. You know, that was kind of the main thing, that they were glad that that was over. Uh, but why did the U.S. have to destroy our city to this degree, you know? Um, and, you know, I did talking to American officials about it. Uh, some Brett McGurk, for example, who is the, um, the uh, special envoy, uh, presidential envoy to the coalition to fight ISIS, he, he told me that, you know, it went, everything went according to plan. Uh, you know, American soldiers didn't die in that war. And uh, I think, you know, that may be part of the reason why it wasn't major news here when that, that battle was happening. Uh, you know, we didn't have soldiers coming back in coffins. Uh, but, you know, the flip side of that is, unlike Fallujah, where we did have soldiers dying, there was on the ground fighting, uh, we didn't in Raqqa. So there, the bombing was much heavier. So the civilian casualties were higher. Also, the casualties of our Syrian allies uh, were, were high. Um, uh, there have been uh, roughly 10,000 um, uh, fighters from the Syrian Democratic Forces that have died in this war. Uh, so, you know, the, the casualties uh, still exist. They're just, you know, not Americans. In following Americans who went to Syria, tell us the story of Samantha al Hassani. Uh, I met Samantha in a refugee camp uh, in Syria. This was a camp that was specifically for the wives of ISIS fighters and their children, uh, mostly foreigners. Um, 
I was allowed access to the camp because uh, officials in um, Rojava were complaining to me that, you know, they have all of these uh, ISIS families, foreigners, and they're trying to get their countries to take them back, but they won't. Uh, so they're essentially stuck with all of these people, and they don't know what to do with them. So they led me in the camp, and there I met uh, Samantha. Um, Samantha's story is uh, bizarre. Um, she is uh, herself uh, a non-Muslim. Um, she married uh, a man named Musa uh, in the United States. He had been, he was uh, from Morocco, had been in the U.S. for about 10 years. Uh, I believe he was studying um, uh, programming um, and had a business, a shipping company in Indiana. And, you know, they met uh, from accounts of uh, people that knew them at the time, uh, both Samantha and Musa were kind of, you know, had kind of wild lives, uh, involved, uh, allegedly involving uh, drugs and, you know, fast cars. And, uh, you know, there was no, religion was no part of it. And uh, then at some point, they kind of suddenly disappeared. Um, they went to Turkey. Uh, they were, by Samantha's account, what she told me is that they were uh, moving, planning to move to Morocco <coughs> and stopped in Turkey. Uh, and essentially... Which is not exactly on the way. Right, right. Well, th they had also gone to Hong Kong before that because uh, Samantha had been um, putting money in safe deposit boxes there. So they, they go to Turkey. Um, they're in southern Turkey. And according to Samantha, they are get in a van and then are suddenly on the border. And uh, her husband grabs one of their children and goes across the border, and she's in this kind of Sophie's Choice moment where uh, she needs to decide whether to follow him or not, and she does. You know, I don't know if this is true. It seems uh, like a fishy story to me, but, uh, you know, what followed seems almost certainly to be have been beyond what she expected she was getting into. Um, she lived in Raqqa uh, for, I think, three years, uh, had two more children. Um, her husband joined ISIS, uh, would go off fighting for stretches at a time. Um, her son, what, which she had from a previous marriage, was uh, used in an ISIS propaganda video uh, threatening Trump. Um, and her husband, uh, or the, they eventually bought uh, three Yazidi slaves. Uh, these Yazidis are of a kind of minority sect, largely in Iraq. Uh, that ISIS had um, att attempted genocide on, and they uh, legitimized the enslavement uh, of women and children. Uh, so he bought these girls, um, you know, essentially as, as sex slaves, and uh, Samantha raised them, and uh, in her view, you they know, were she, children. They, they were 14, 16-year-old uh, girls and a younger boy. Um, and, you know, in, in Samantha's view of what she's told me is that, you know, she, she thought she was kind of uh, protecting them, um, that they, you know, would have been worse off somewhere else. And she uh, eventually uh, would escape with them, and they would go back home. Um, Samantha lived through the, the war, the, uh, the, the U.S.-led assault on Raqqa. Um, she was... Uh, smuggled out of Raqqa. There was a, there was a truce between uh, the, the U.S.-led coalition and ISIS, and uh, they allowed ISIS to leave and go to deeper into his territory, and she was brought with them. Uh, and eventually, she hired a, a smuggler and was able to escape. And she's now in, uh, in jail in, in Indiana pending trial. And what will she be tried for? For uh, support of uh, terrorism, material support. Mm -hmm. And what is her argument? You know, it remains to be seen. Uh, there, there's not a lot of documentation out yet, but it seems that her defense um, is uh, going to claim that she was a victim of her husband. Uh, she had, um, by the accounts of others, had been abused by him before they went to Syria. Um, uh, he seemed to uh, he seemed to have been very abusive, and so the circumstances of how exactly she got there uh, are still not not clear at all. Shane, you also speak to a number of uh, Syrians. You profile a number mm. of Syrians uh, uh, in your article, and all of them uh, have extremely interesting things uh, to say to you and with whom you develop uh, uh, relationships. Uh, 
where they tell you uh, uh, all kinds of things. Now, one of the person, uh, one of the people you spoke to is Mohammed Abdullah, who goes by the name Artino. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about who he was, how he came to become a photographer? And we were speaking earlier about the chemical weapons attack in eastern yeah. Ghouta. His descriptions, what he told you, because he went to a hospital in eastern Ghouta right after the attack. Yeah. Artino was uh, one of the people that joined the initial uprising uh, very early on. He uh, became a kind of media activist. You know, he would film the uprising. Uh, if the, the uh, security forces fired on protesters, he would film it and post it online. Uh, and he eventually, you know, was uh, sought after uh, by the regime. He was arrested a couple of times. And uh, instead of fleeing the country, he left Damascus to the suburb of eastern Ghouta, where his family had a summer home. There he could kind of lay low. Uh, the area was uh, under control of the opposition at that time, and then and became under control of, of the armed opposition as uh, the armed opposition grew. Uh, so it was for a while a kind of um, liberated zone in some ways. He described it as um, uh, you know, feeling uh, free there in a way he had never felt uh, before in Syria. Um, the the war uh, intensified between rebels there and the regime, and the regime uh, uh, essentially cordoned off Ghouta. Uh, they were not letting food in and out, um, and the conditions got more and more dire. Uh, and eventually, uh, one, late one night, uh, there was a, a sarin attack. Uh, roughly 1,400 people were killed. And Artino, at that point, uh, was working as a photographer. He had um, uh, met a photojournalist uh, who trained him and uh, got him a job at Reuters. So he was essentially covering Guta for Reuters. And, the, d the morning after the chemical attack, he, he went to the, the hospitals and mosques and schools where, where people were being brought who were victims of the, the attack. And, the, you know, the situation he described, combined with, you know, the videos that I've seen online, it was just absolutely horrific. Um, you know, he is going into rooms that are just full of uh, dead children on the floor. Uh, he's seeing people that are um, seem to be kind of hallucinating or delusional. They're repeating the same thing over and over. Um, uh, doctors and nurses are getting infected. And he himself, uh, when he was uh, trying to take a photo of a, a child, he, you know, lost consciousness. The, the sarin was just... Um, uh, you know, it was, in, it was impacting everyone that were around, the, the, even just the, the bodies of the people who had been in the zone of the attack. Uh, he was given uh, atropine, which is an antidote, so he uh, survived. Um, you know, and he described that, that, that period of time when, uh, after the attack, uh, people expected that there would be a, a U.S. response because Obama had made his famous red line uh, statement. And uh, he described the day that uh, Obama made a speech uh, shortly after the, the chemical attack. It was very anticipated. Uh, Guta didn't have electricity, but people had generators, and people bought fuel to, to be able to watch the speech and gather on televisions. And uh, Obama had, you know, been having uh, domestic uh, kind of battles uh, with uh, Republicans, and Republicans were, were against him. Um, uh, striking in Syria, um, and he announced that he was going to seek congressional approval. And uh, in Ghouta, the way that Artino described it, you know, people were, were very disappointed. They just couldn't believe that they went through this horror and there was going to be no uh, kind of response. Uh, and, you know, Ghouta left the headlines, um, but Artino lived there for a long time after, and the, the siege tightened. Uh, he lost uh, many, many pounds. Um, he, uh, you know, was repeatedly injured. People were starving to death. Um, it just became very grim. And then, and at the same time, uh, the the rebels, you know, were overtaken by Islamist groups. Uh, so he was not only having to deal with the siege, but um, Islamist groups who were also uh, kidnapping activists and, uh, you know, disappearing some of the most uh, uh, famous activists in the the Syrian opposition. 
I want to ask you about these gas attacks, and you write extensively about them, but how you know where these attacks have come from. Uh, the State Department um, has said that the Syrian government may have used chemical weapons during recent fighting in Idlib. Uh, the State Department warning the United States and its allies would respond quickly and appropriately if it's determined that chemical weapons have been used. And this all coming as questions have been raised about, well, an alleged chemical weapons attack in the city of Douma last year. The Syrian government was accused of dropping two gas cylinders on the city, killing dozens of people. The U.S. and allies responded by carrying out airstrikes. But a newly leaked internal document from the Organization for Prohibition of Chemical Weapons, OPCW, reveals there were conflicting views within the OPCW as to what happened. The leaked document suggesting the cylinders were manually placed on the ground and were not dropped from the air. This led some observers to conclude the chemical attack might have been staged by Syrian rebels. The leaked document appears to contradict the official OPCW findings on what happened in Douma. It's a, in its official report, the organization said it had found, quote, reasonable grounds that the use of a toxic chemical as a weapon had taken place on April 7, 2018. So talk about how you track who is responsible for these gas attacks of which, and you clearly document this in your extensive piece, there have been hundreds. Yeah. Uh, so the original sarin attack, for example, this, this one I was describing in Ghouta in 2013, uh, there was a U.N. Uh, team that investigated afterwards. And the U.N. team was not actually— uh, their mission was not to determine who was responsible. It was to determine what the, the attack was, um, what the substance was. Uh, they determined that it was sarin. Uh, I spoke to the head of the team, um, and in their in their report, uh, while they're not determining, uh, saying who launched the attack, they uh, clearly lay out uh, where the the sarin was launched from. Uh, they showed that it was the head of the inspection team told me it was high grade sarin. This is uh, not the kind of sarin that you can uh, make at home. Uh, and it was launched from the direction of a uh, military site on uh, the Qasiyun Mountain um, in, uh, on the outside of Damascus. Um, you know, when you add up all of these factors uh, and try to imagine a scenario in which uh, some other group is launching it, you have uh, somehow, uh, you know, a rogue group that's uh, making military-grade sarin that's sneaking into an area uh, controlled by the government, launching a weapon uh, on its own side and escaping without being caught. Um, and, you know, this kind of scenario uh, repeats over and over when you look at these chemical attacks, where uh, the, uh, the scenario in which uh, they're not launched by the Syrian government is it's almost, you know, outside of reason. Uh, then later, after this attack, other attacks have been documented uh, much more extensively. Uh, the attack in uh, Khan Sheikhoun um, was uh, studied by the UN, and they did assign responsibility. Uh, and, you know. And they said it was. That it was the Syrian government. Um, and it's important to also note that while there have been a, 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 maybe two or three attacks that have gotten a lot of attention, they've been really picked apart. Uh, and, you know, uh, Russia has been a, a major actor in uh, casting doubt on this. Russia is an ally of the Syrian government. Um, uh, there have been hundreds of chemical attacks in Syria. Most of these are chlorine attacks, not sarin attacks, uh, that have been extensively studied. Uh, and the, there was a, a recent study that came out that showed that uh, the vast majority of these, and we're talking over 95 percent of these, uh, have been launched by the Syrian government. There have been some uh, launched by ISIS, uh, specifically a mustard and uh, possibly one sarin attack. Well, I mean, one of the things that you point out in the piece is that, I mean, there's no other war in recent memory that has been subject to so many disinformation campaigns yeah. and so many conspiracy theories. And coming at this point from all quarters, I mean, as you said, the Russians and, and the Assad government yeah. itself, that the Assad government doesn't have the reach that Russian media do. Um, 
refuting uh, uh, a number of these international uh, organizations that have reported on these attacks, and then simultaneously groups uh, in the West, certain groups, mm. uh, claiming that a lot of these attacks are, in fact, fl false flag operations and that these are all a pretext to get the U.S. to yeah. militarily intervene, including Republican you cite former uh, Congress member Ron Paul, who also claimed that the Ruta attack was a false flag operation. Now, obviously, there's some justification, given the claims that the U.S. made about uh, uh, Iraq's uh, weapons of, of mass destruction, and arguably the decision that the U.S. made to go into the uh, to invade Iraq is, in fact, what's given rise to uh, ISIS and spawned uh, these wars, at least one of the main uh, reasons. But could you comment on what you think? Uh, I mean, the complexity of the war is there. So many different actors are involved. What do you think accounts for the fact that there are so many conflicting reports from so many conflicting different quarters about what's actually happening in Syria and who's responsible for what? I mean, at this point in the war and in the last uh, at least several years, people—the war has become so entrenched and people on the outside are so invested on different sides of the war that— uh, you know, people are, are fighting the ground war and people outside are fighting an information war. Um, and for so many people, what is happening in Syria is not, uh, uh, you know, necessarily about fact, it's about winning. Um, and I think for a lot of people, it's also not about Syrians. You know, it's uh, Syria is a full proxy war. Uh, and I think, uh, I don't know if we've had a conflict like this where uh, it's not only a literal proxy war, but it just ripples, the ripples go so far. Um, I mean, you can find uh, uh, major divisions uh, just within the American left about the Syrian war, you know, um, you, and this is all over the world, you know, there, uh, uh, it's just, the, it reaches, I think, farther than we, we can even realize. Um, and, you know, in some ways, I think these points that people, uh, that people kind of focus in on, like, p particular chemical attacks, uh, you know, they're also just uh, places that we can kind of fight these, these battles with each other. But in some ways, um, you know, they uh, are maybe not as relevant as we make them. Um, I mean, the last study of uh, civilian casualties in Syria was 2016, and that put them at uh, half a million. And the know. vast majority of whom have been con killed by conventional weapons. Yes, and uh, studies have, have shown that around 85 percent of uh, civilian deaths have come from the Assad regime. Um, you know, this doesn't uh, mean that uh, groups like ISIS or Nusra or the Free Syrian Army are, uh, you know, uh, absolved of, of any of their uh, crimes or any of their atrocities. Uh, this, these are just the facts of the situation, you know, and uh, whether you, uh, you know, whatever you think about American intervention or Russian intervention or anybody's intervention, this is still the fact on the ground. This is still what is happening in Syria. And where do you see this going? As we begin to wrap up your piece called Behind the Lines, I went to Syria to understand America's role in one of the 21st century's greatest tragedies. Do you think you understand any more? <laughs> um, I'm still confused in some ways about this uh, conflict. It's incredibly complex. Uh, I think now, you know, Assad has, has clearly won the war. There's no doubt about that. And I think this final or the current phase of the war is about who, territory and who's ultimately going to control what. Uh, is Assad going to get back all of Syria? Uh, he's currently uh, fighting in Idlib to try to take that from uh, opposition forces. And then there's still the question of uh, the uh, of northeast Syria, the area that is under U.S. control. Uh, this is 25 percent of the country. And, uh, you know, Trump recently announced that he was going to withdraw troops, and there was a lot of panic around it, uh, understandably, because, you know, a sudden American withdrawal uh, could likely mean, will likely mean that Turkey, you know, will invade to fight its enemy, the YPG, and uh, this will be a horrific situation for the Kurds in Syria. Uh, it could also mean that the Kurds in Syria ally with uh, Assad to keep Turkey out. Uh, you know, which is also going to have detrimental effects. Um, we just don't know where it's going to go. And not to mention, there are still uh, 
thousands of ISIS uh, fighters being held there. And uh, there are hundreds that are from other countries that are not being taken back. Syria has, in some ways, been uh, used as a kind of dumping ground uh, for these people. And uh, not only is, is that not fair, but it's just not smart. I mean, ISIS has broken out of prisons many times. <laughs> Imagine a situation when Turkey uh, has a massive military invasion. You think these people are going to stay in these uh, small jails that they're being held in? Probably not. Well, let's end uh, with the person whom you end the peace with, your Kurdish fixer, Ibrahim. So as you were preparing to leave, explain what happened between you and Ibrahim. Um, I had worked with Ibrahim uh, on and off during my time there, specifically when I was in Kurdish areas. Uh, and he, he had been a journalist uh, covering uh, a lot of the war. He was in Raqqa. He uh, covered the ISIS attack on Sinjar. He saw people, you know, fleeing Sinjar with literal dead children in their hands. He had seen horrific things. He had been uh, threatened. His village had been threatened by ISIS. Uh, and during the time that I knew him, uh, he, he, I rarely saw him eat. He was having really serious physical problems. And he told me that uh, there was a time before I came, uh, a couple months before I came, Trump had, had announced that he was pulling out troops. And that since that had happened, he was uh, having serious stomach pain. Uh, he, he was just, he didn't know what he would do uh, if Turkey invaded. Um, and... You know, he he was clearly kind of struggling, and on uh, a couple of days before I left Syria, you know, we had an appointment, and uh, he kind of uh, told me he was having issues with his car and he needed more money. And I'm in Syria, you know, there's no ATMs in Syria. I just have what I have, and I tell him I don't have it, and uh, he kind of just um, uh, snaps, you know, and he you know shouts at me. Um, uh, you know, if this is what America is, you can keep it. And he punches me in the face, and I jump into a taxi. And that's the last time I saw him. It was an unfortunate way to to leave the country. Shane Bauer, award-winning senior reporter at Mother Jones, his latest investigative piece is an in-depth look at the role of the U.S. in the war in Syria. He spent three weeks in northeast Syria in May 2018. The multimedia feature in two parts is headlined Behind the Lines, and we'll link to it at democracynow.org. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. Thanks so much for joining us.